You want to support Roller Martin Unfiltered? Be sure to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar that you give to us supports our daily digital show. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. It's Roller Martin Unfiltered. By going to rollermartinunfiltered.com, you can make this possible. Of course, we've been focused on uh, 16, 19, 2019. I told y'all we were launching this segment. I think we're going to do every single week, uh, week talking about that. And so we also put together uh, his intro to it. Uh, y'all fire up the intro. Uh, I'm going to set it up. Uh, and so explain more about it. So our goal with this is very simple, and that is uh, a lot of people had events commemorating the 400th anniversary of the first 20 odd Africans arriving that, uh, that really, some say, began this whole issue of the slave trade in the United States. We did not simply want to spend, you know, two or three days on this. We really want to unpack this thing a lot more deeply uh, and really get people to understand the impact uh, of the last 400 years, what it has meant on the psyche of African Americans, but also on us economically, on our health, all those different issues. Uh, and it's, so, so it goes beyond just, just folks arriving in Point Comfort, Comfort, Virginia in 1619. No, not in Jamestown. What's now Hampton, Virginia. We wanted to focus on that. And see, that, even, even that great car, I think, is part of this thing as well. We talk about the rewriting of history, where for the longest it was, oh, they arrived in Jamestown, when in fact, no, they arrived where a whole bunch of black people are right now. That's exactly right. This Hampton Roads area. It'd be interesting to hear from uh, Professor uh, Newby Alexander, who is, I'm glad you got her, one of the experts on Hampton Roads and uh, Portsmouth and that whole area. Um, when we think about it, yeah, but Jamestown fits the narrative. So when you're telling a story that's really more about who you want to be today than it is about what happened in history, we need this segment every week because and everybody should tune in because they're going to learn a whole lot more about what really happened <laughs> as and what is still happening as distinct from what this, this the fantasy story is. And of course, we've been it's been positioned that uh, that the first 29 Africans arrived here that everybody who came was enslaved, and in fact, there were some people who were indentured servants. So joining us, Dr. Cassandra Newby Alexander, a history professor and dean at Norfolk State University. Doc, glad to have you here. And so, can you unpack this for us? Uh, uh, were, were there people of African descent who were indentured servant, servants, or did everybody who come over, were they all enslaved? So thank you for the question. Uh, one of the things that I try to tell people is when you're talking about this time period uh, and you're talking about uh, England and what they did in the Virginia slash Jamestown colony was you're, you're talking about a period in which there was no organized system of slavery. There was a system in the Spanish colonies and Portuguese colonies and elsewhere, but not in the English colony, in particular in Virginia. And so when we talk about who was arriving and whether or not they were enslaved or indentured servants or whatever, I usually like to say that they were bonded, meaning they were unfree people because their status was really not defined until a little bit later. Usually, uh, historians trace it to about the 1640s when we started to see court cases put in place that essentially began to take away the rights and privileges of those who were in bondage but not necessarily enslaved. So, so, what, so I want to go right there. So what you're saying is that uh, during this period, so of course folks coming in 1619, that people of African descent had rights and, but yes. then laws began to get changed oh, that yes. took away those rights, voting rights, property rights. Can you unpack that? Sure. So the colony did not have a clear system of any kind of enslavement in place. There were no laws. In fact, Massachusetts, the Plymouth colony in particular, was the first to create laws, I believe it was in 1641, to enslave those Africans who were arriving. But in Virginia, it would take until the 1660s before we would see some clear laws put in place. Now, what we would see in these early years are Africans being treated more as servants. Now, there's a difference between an indentured servant that had a contract and those who did not. There were some English people who had been kidnapped and made to be in bondage in the Virginia colony. 
as long as they didn't serve more than 20 years, that was allowed because anything after 20 years was seen as slavery. Hmm. And we would see many of the Africans who were arriving actually file freedom suits claiming that they were Christians and they could no longer be held in bondage beyond a certain point in time. And we started to see those particular freedom suits by the 1640s, 1650s. And that suggests to us that people were trying to hold them longer than a maximum of 20 years. Wow. Wow. Uh, any questions from the panel? Yeah, can uh, I ask yeah, just real quick? First of all, Professor uh, Nubia Zan, thank you for your work, first of all, uh, your ongoing work. How important is it for us to understand the difference between English enslavement, a, a English enslavement and the Spanish and French versions, which were more based on religion, like Catholicism? The English, of course, couldn't do that. So it sounds like when these Africans began pursuing what it, for, for the fr those enslaved by the French and the, Sp and the Spanish became the issue, the question of religion, England couldn't base its form of unfree labor on religion. Is this when they began to tease out race as the way they were going to do this? Yes. In fact, what is interesting is that a lot of the English ministers who were arriving in the colony uh, in the 1620s, 1630s, actually began to write about uh, people of color. And in fact, by the time we get into the 1650s and 1660s, they're clearly stating that there is no way that these individuals could be Christians because they were black. So they were defining mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Christianity and whiteness as uh, somehow synonymous with one another. Uh, that was not the case in, uh, it, with Catholicism. So that is really why in the English colonies, there was not the same kind of protection of human rights the way that we would see that written into the Spanish and Portuguese and other Catholic-oriented colonies. But that's not to say that the people were treated kindly or gently. Uh, there were still allowances uh, by owners, even in the Spanish and Portuguese colonies, to really abuse people. Julian. Sister, I really appreciate your work and thank you for it. Um, I have a question about 1619 because there's a part of it to me that seems to be a false narrative. In other words, the first black people did not come here in 1619. There were some other black people here before that. And I think we need to sort of unpack some of that. Also, the... We will. That's another segment. Okay, but the other thing about the 1619 <laughs> narrative, <laughs> Roland, uh, always couldn't, Roland always smacking me down, but whatever. Um, the other piece about it is the, uh, the extent to which it really lifts up the British and doesn't look at everything else that was going on here, so it becomes a whiteness narrative. So I'm interested in your perspective on that because as I read it, it sounds like the Brits and white people are taking away what was really happening in this country pre-1619, which included Native American people. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, one of the reasons why there's a commemoration for 1619 is because even though the Jamestown colony was founded in 1607, the reality is that the Jamestown colony, which later became the Virginia colony, was not going to survive for the most part until 1619. When we saw the creation of the first limited legislative body, that really set in motion the idea that this colony would now survive. You had a body that was making laws, that was creating a court system and so forth. And so it was at that time that we also saw the, the evolution of a system, a cultural system, a legal system, as well as an economic system. Now, while blacks were not dominating any of those systems, they became in some ways victims of those systems, especially the legal system, that almost immediately began to demarcate them as different. When they came in, they were not called by their ethnic name or by their name for that matter. They were simply regarded as black people, Negroes. And that really was very different than any of the other servants coming in. However, they had um, authority to some degree or standing before the courts because they were filing lawsuits against their owners uh, for holding them too long, uh, punishing them harshly, et cetera, et cetera. And so when I talk about 1619, 
I try to emphasize that we're not talking about these are the first Africans who were on the North American continent, but rather these are the people who at the the real founding of American society and culture in the first colony of the nation were there at its formation and their culture, their activities, even their presence um, sort of laid the foundations for our society, culture, and especially our laws. Greetings, doctor. You're doing some excellent work, and I, and I want to thank you for it. I have a question. You, you referenced earlier that even though the legislation of enslavement happened in the 40s and then later, in terms of the 1600s, that the bad treatment still occurred. So my, yes. focus, my focus is kind of around the treatment, because I travel around the footprints of enslavement through the Caribbean, throughout the continent, throughout this country. And one thing I've found out about people in the Caribbean and, and other parts of the diaspora is that they still have some direct African sensibilities, sometimes food, sometimes accents, sometimes cultural practice. And a lot of that has been domesticated out of African Americans. And I'm wondering, during the time that, of 1619, when that did the this domestication and the lynching and the terrorization start then, or did it happen uh, parallel to the removal of human rights completely later in the in the forties in the six in the sixties in terms of sixteen hundreds? So I'd like to answer that question by sort of posing this idea, and and that is that when we talk about Southern cuisine. What are we really talking about? Mm -hmm. So we started to see the emergence of what we call Southern cuisine at that particular time. And it actually incorporated foods and folkways and customs, not just the English, not just the native peoples, but more importantly, the Africans. Because there's really no difference between Southern and African American cuisine. And so mm -hmm. just those two terms really talks about the appropriation of blackness, yeah. black culture, as a factor that began very, very early on. And, and so this whole commemoration about 1619 is about restoring that place that Africans had in the creation and evolution of American society and culture. And so the appropriation is being identified and put in proper perspective because we want to make sure that people understand that the English did not just create this country all by themselves, that the native peoples didn't disappear after Pocahontas died, and that the people who were of African descent played a major role, not only in the evolution of this country, but in the very definition of, of, of what freedom, equality, civil rights, civil liberties was all about because they challenged every action, whether it was by running away, by fighting in the courts, uh, or by fighting physically. We would see this action take place almost from the beginning. We would see it when people ran away trying to gain their freedom. We would see it when they filed cases in court, and we would see it even in some of the revolts. All right, Dr. Cassandra Newby Alexander, history professor and dean at Norfolk State University. We appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. All right, folks, back to our whole Mark Unfiltered video in just one moment. All right, folks, this Friday, if you're going to be in Atlanta, I'll be there. You don't want to miss me at the Ride Money in Motion Conference at the Louder Milk Center, moderating a panel about access and ownership sponsored by Banji, the only African-American-owned publicly traded cannabis organization in the world. I'll be on the panel. Matthew Knowles, Bonita Money, Ryan Mack, and the whole Banji family will be front and center discussing entry into the multi-billion dollar and growing cannabis industry and how you can become a distributor, shareholder, or cannabis landlord. If you are interested in making money in this booming industry, then I promise you, you don't want to miss this. Our panel is going to be at 2.30, but for a full list of other panels, activations, and tickets, please visit ride.rollingout.com. Ride.rollingout.com. And so you don't, don't want to miss it again. As this Friday in Atlanta, and you certainly don't want to miss it. I want you guys to be there uh, because why? Everybody keeps talking about expungement, which is critically important, but this is a $340 billion global industry, and black folks should be on the front end of making money when it comes to cannabis as opposed to 
us having to spend money because our people were thrown in jail for selling it. And so, again, we will certainly want to have you guys uh, at that. And so that's taking place again this uh, Friday in Atlanta. So please don't miss it. All right, folks, I'm back to your Roland Martin Unfiltered video.